You know what a sign of a, a good church is and a growing church, George? We ran out of baskets during children's story. That's a good thing when you've got more kids than you, you, know, you have enough baskets for. And uh, we're going to correct that. We're going to make sure we have more uh, so every kid uh, can participate in that. But I love that. I love that. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your, in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm going to continue on in the thought stream that I began last week about attitudes in the Bible. and I uh, talked a little bit about complaining last week, and I apologize that I kind of started on the negative, but that's how the story begins when we think about the journey that God took His people on from Egypt to the Promised Land. As soon as they kind of get to a place where the Egyptians aren't on their neck and they're, they're kind of going... Uh, uh, on the direction God wants them, Numbers 11 says that they rose up and became like those who complain. So that's how the story goes. But today we're going to talk about the inverse of that or the opposite of that, and that's gratitude. I appreciate the children's story that uh, talked about thankfulness, and that was perfectly uh, woven in. So uh, I'm going to begin with just this question. Did you complain more or less last week? Did you, did you notice a difference at all? We talked about complaining last week. We talked about the, uh, the seriousness of complaining, uh, that it is a, a terrible and deadly vice even, and yet it's become so natural and normal to our character and to our society, we don't even really realize we're doing it. In some cases, we're actually encouraged to do it, um, but we know that it is a, a terrible thing. And uh, you know, since we talk about it, you know, whenever you start talking about something in your life, it feels like the devil attacks you more in that area. Maybe you felt the, the need to complain even more this week uh, because we, we focused on that. Did you reduce your consumption of social media and politics? And again, I just use that as a practical example because I'm not saying those things are completely an evil, but they tend to feed the spirit of complaining. Do any of you ever read like the comments in the blogs and stuff? How many of those are filled with praise and thankfulness and joy, right? It's just this... Uh, smorgasbord of just uh, complaining. It, that's, that's what it seems like to me. And then the third question, did you find anything to replace complaining with? Like any vice, you can't, it's hard just to, to, to quit cold turkey. If you've ever tried to give up smoking or maybe biting your nails or even gossiping, it, you know, you, sometimes you tell yourself, I'm just going to stop, just going to stop. But we know from a clinical uh, standpoint, you often have to replace that behavior with something. Uh, smokers will sometimes chew gum or they'll, they'll find something else because they're so used to having something in their mouth and in their hand that you, you, you find a replacement for it. Well, it's the same true with the negative attitudes that we sometimes have. It's, it's good if we can just stop doing it altogether, but we need to understand that there's an opposite to every vice. Or to every virtue, there's a vice. For every good thing of God, there's a counterfeit of the devil. And thankfulness and gratitude is the replacement for complaining. If we have a spirit of thankfulness and gratitude, uh, I mean, when you think about what complaining is, it is a, it is a rejection of, of, of thankfulness. And I actually have more slides than just here. <laughs> So it's frozen up or it's done something. Thank you. An attitude, an attitude of gratitude. You've all heard that before, right? It's this nice little phrase. It's easy to remember. An attitude of gratitude. An attitude of complaining must be replaced with a spirit of thankfulness and gratitude. It's not enough to just bite our tongues. It's not enough just to keep silent and say, oh, I want to complain, but I'm not going to complain. But you dwell in that. It, it, then it'll breed bitterness. It'll breed discontent and other things. We want to actually replace that discontented, grumbling, complaining attitude with something that is filling and going to bless us. And I think that attribute and that attitude that the Bible gives us is gratitude. So that's what I want to talk with you about today. Now, I'm going to... Well, it went too far. That might have been me. Or Okay. This is from Ministry of Healing. If you've not read Ministry of Healing... 
recently. You will not be disappointed if you picked it up and read it again. It's probably one of my favorite of the Spirit of Prophecy volumes. Now listen to this. Nothing tends to promote, tends more to promote health of body and of soul than does a spirit of gratitude and praise. Nothing tends to more to tends more to promote a health of body and soul than does a spirit of gratitude and praise. I'm going to read it one more time. Nothing, Mrs. White says, tends more to promote health of body and uh, health of body and of soul than does a spirit of gratitude and praise. That's a pretty substantial statement, wouldn't you say? It is a positive duty to resist melancholy, discontented thoughts and feelings as much as a duty as it is to pray. That is pretty significant, isn't it? As much as it is a duty to pray, as much as God calls upon us to live in that communion with Him, to open up our hearts and speak to our Heavenly Father, as much as a duty is it to that, is it our duty to resist the temptation to discontent and complaining and grumbling? That is an amazing thing. Our journey towards the promised land, okay, the first step that we take as believers as after we've received salvation, God, and again, we're using the, uh, the, the, the journey, right, from, from uh, uh, the wilderness wanderings, right, as our model. The, after salvation, after we've received the sanctuary and the community and the temple and all these blessings of God, the first step that we have to take on that journey of positive Christian experience and getting ready for the promised land is to develop a spirit of thankfulness. We must replace that slavery-bound attitude of complaining with an attitude of thankfulness. It sounds easy. It sounds uh, like a no-brainer, but it is more intense than that. So, Toby, are you going to help me again? I just have a few questions for our kids this morning. I haven't even asked them yet, Sebastian, Eric. Are blue and yellow going to be okay? Check, 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 check. Yellow? Oh, okay, and could I have one more? Oh, thank you, Derek, Mr. Heisey. All right, question number one. Toby, would you come on this side? Now, again, this is just for the kids. Raise your hand. I'd like to interact with you. The mics help everybody here and helps it for the recording. When should we be thankful? Of all these options, which one really should you be thankful for? Is it after a good meal? Yeah, after sleeping well, after opening a present, or is it when church gets over? Man, what's the one? Hey, don't get too excited about this one. Okay, we're going to go over here. Is that Anthony? E, all of the above. Oh, so you're going to play that game. I got you. Okay, let's have a couple more. Go ahead, Derek, whichever ones. We got Eric here? Uh, E. Oh, you're going to go with that one too. E. Okay, I think they... I think they want to play that game. Let's see. You are right. You are right. I, th I see it, guys. We can't have everybody in every circumstance. But yes, you did notice the, the idea. The Bible says that we should be thankful how often? How often? Always. Always. And here in 1 Thessalonians, Paul says, in everything give thanks. Okay? Now, he doesn't say for everything give thanks. Okay, we don't need to be thankful for death. We don't need to be thankful for disease. We don't need to be thankful for uh, adversity and things like that. But in those circumstances, in those moments, there is always something to be thankful for. Uh, when we had, uh, I'm, uh, forgive me if I've used this illustration before. Don't go away, guys. I'm still going to need you. But uh, we had this windstorm here on campus, you know, and all the trees that fell down and they had a big cleanup, right? And uh, I was talking with uh, uh, Mr. G, uh, food services director guy, um, Robert, you know, and I said, man, Robert, what a mess. What a, what a terrible mess here. And he said to me, yeah, but what a great opportunity for us to come together and do a project. Don't you hate people like that? <laughs> Always looking at the good things. Oh, they can be so annoying. No, I actually was like, what a great attitude. What a great way of looking at it. There is always more to the story than just what the circumstances might show. The Bible says in everything, there is something to see the grace of God and there is something to see God's handiwork at place. In everything, 
give thanks. Now, not, the second part of this is just as significant. For this is God's will. This is what he wants for you. This is his gift for you. This is what distinguishes you as a child of God. This is what makes you different from someone who is still in slavery to sin. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We should find ways to always see God's hand at work. Which book of the Bible mentions gratitude and thankfulness the most? Let's see some hands now. There's some in the booth back there, Toby. Is it Genesis, Psalms, Proverbs, or Isaiah? All right, Abel. Isaiah, I think. Oh, Isaiah, where are you? He thinks it's you, buddy, and I'm awfully thankful for you, but that wasn't the right one. All right, Dylan. Psalms? Wow. What do you guys think? You think Psalms might be it? All right, Sean, let's have give you chat. Psalms. Okay. Now, we're going to stop there because Psalms is actually that book of praise. It makes sense, and that's the right answer. Over 50 times, and depending on how many words that you can apply, gratitude, thankfulness, praise, it would be many, many more, but just that word of thanksgiving and gratitude over 50 times in the Psalms, and this is just an example from Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the God of gods, for His loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the Lord of hosts, for His loving kindness is how long? Yeah, over and over again, the Psalms remind us about the importance of thankfulness. Three, were the children of Israel thankful as they traveled to the promised land? Let's see some hands. All right, Owen's ready to go. No. He says no. I'll give one other chance over here. Who do we got? Matthew. Oh, that's profound. That's, um, that's wonderful. All right, Julian. They were not happy at all. <laughs> they were not happy at all. Okay, they got it, guys. We got, we've got got so, another one coming up. So we know the story. I already kind of talked about it earlier. We looked at it last week. They were not people that were happy. Now, this is the last question. Did they have something to be thankful for, or what did they have to be thankful for? Let's come right here. That they at least got out. That they what? That they at least got out. They at least got out. Yeah, they're no longer in slavery. You'd think that would be something. Yay! We, you know, they'd be thankful for that. All right, I see Abel and, uh, and Dylan. That God was still with them. God was still with them. Dylan? That they get to eat good food. That they, they don't have to eat grain all day. I've never had manna, but I suppose it was probably wonderful. Eric? At least they had food. At least they had food. Okay, a couple of... Uh, I can see Isaiah and Andre. Uh, uh, being nice to people. Okay, yeah. Toby over here, Julian's got one for us. What do they have to be thankful for? Moses leading them. Moses leading them. I like that. They're thankful for their pastor. Yes, sirree. <laughs> Love it. That God loved them. That God loved them. That's absolutely right. Okay, thank you. Uh, appreciate the kids. Appreciate our microphone. Operator technicians, thank you. So you can just set it on the front pew there. Now, for again, like I said earlier, for every circumstance, there is always two ways of looking at it. They could have said, ah, we're in the desert. Oh, it's so hot in the desert. Why do we have to be in the desert? Yeah, but at least you're not in slavery. Oh, I wish we could eat that great Egyptian food. Or so tired of this manna. Oh, that. Yeah, but that was because you were a slave. Now at least you're headed toward the land of milk and honey. Oh, the wildlife out here is so rough. All these snakes and all this wildlife. Yeah, but God is leading you. And if you weren't sinning so much, he would be taking care of you. Right? They, there's always two ways to be looking at the story. And so that is the challenge for us as believers, that God gave them freedom, food, wealth, hope, guidance, power. You, they could say, oh, but all the nations around us are so powerful. They're like giants. Yeah, but you've got the presence of the Lord leading you as a pillar of fire by night and a tornado during the day. How could you fear the people around you? But they're like giants. Okay. God doesn't force himself on us and say, you've just got to see it my way. He invites us to look at it through the eyes of faith, and he gives us lots of evidence. Nevertheless, this is what we read last week, just to remind us. With most of them, God was not well pleased. They were laid low in the wilderness. Now, these things happen as examples for the Scottsdale Thunderbird Church. These things happen as examples for us. 
They are there for us to read and learn, not just a fairy tale, fairy tale story that we read about in the Old Testament and say, well, wasn't that interesting? No, these things happen for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also crave. Okay, they were craving evil things. Notice the language there. It's not just that they made a mistake. It's not just that they had a bad day. They had a spirit of craving evil. Nearly everything in our culture today is calculated to make it difficult to be thankful and easy to be unhappy and ungrateful. I, I don't force that upon you, but I think that there's a lot of truth to that. One of the things, and I, 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 forgive me if I've mentioned this before, but it seems to be a, a more recent phenomenon I've, I've noticed in our society, in our culture, and in advertisements lately, is virtually everything someone's trying to sell you, it seems like today, they're always telling you, you deserve it. Have you noticed that? Okay, when you're listening to the radio or you're watching TV and it, oh, it's a car commercial, this is the pickup you deserve, right? You're watching a commercial, this is the burrito you deserve. This is the car insurance you deserve. Everyone's trying to tell you what you deserve. And, and again, we do deserve things in life. I'm not trying to say that if you, you know, don't uh, you know, do your job, you deserve the paycheck at the end of the week. But when you constantly hear this message of you deserve, you deserve, it kind of creates a pride. It kind of creates this idea that just by breathing air on planet Earth, I deserve to have everything I want. I don't have to earn it. I don't have to think about it. I just deserve the goodness that I think that I, I should have. And that is not a good position for us to be in. It creates an environment for complaining. Why don't I have it? I was told I deserve it, but I don't have it. And it battles against the spirit of thankfulness that God wants us to have. But God wants to give you the power to overcome this complaining attitude and to be thankful. And it does, friends, it does take the power of the Holy Spirit. It is an absolute necessity. If you try to overcome the sinful nature, if you try to just weave your way through this life saying, well, God, it's great that you're in my life, but I'm going to keep you over here, you will find it being very difficult to overcome these vices and this tendency to start the journey of complaint and delay that opportunity to develop habits of being, thanks, of being thankful and having gratitude. It requires His power. Now notice this. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me. Now amen. He gives us strength, right? Let me try that again. <clears throat> he gives us strength, right? Oh, that's a little better. I can still do some work there, but I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful by putting me into service. The Lord Jesus doesn't come into our life just to uh, uh, say everything, the, the way it's going in your life is fine. He comes to change us. He comes to help us be overcomers and to give us power. And that includes slaying the beast of grumbling and complaining that lives inside of us and then replacing it with the spirit of gratitude and thankfulness. Now, there's a story in the Bible that we're going to look at today to illustrate this. If you have your Bibles, it's in Luke. It's not going to be on the screen. I want you to see it in your Bibles. You may be familiar with it. I think it is a great story illustrating the principles of gratitude. Luke chapter 17 and beginning in verse 11, the healing of the 10 lepers. Luke chapter 17 and beginning in verse 11. I'm going to give a little background to the story here. It says this in verse 11. While he was on his way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. Now, he had recently resurrected Lazarus. When you compare Luke and John, you can see that these stories are happening fairly close together. The Jews are trying to kill him. He flees Jerusalem, okay, and he's doing a missionary circus, circuit, excuse me, <laughs> circuit, up in the northern regions where he grew up. He's passed between Galilee, and he's now on the borders between Samaria and Galilee. The other thing that's important to note is this is probably late March. He's a few weeks from his crucifixion. And Luke chapter 9 tells us that he had set his sights towards going to Jerusalem because he knew the days of his, of his ascension were drawing near. He's a few weeks from the cross. I think that's just interesting to recognize the context here. 
Even a few weeks from the cross, Jesus is still not thinking of himself. He's thinking of others. While he was on his way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee, and he entered a village, and ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. He was going into the village. Lepers were not allowed into the city. They had to stay on the outside of the city. Often there would be beggars and lepers on the outside of of a city, but these ten lepers almost show that they were expecting Christ. Back in Luke chapter 5, he had healed another man with leprosy, and he tells that man a very similar thing as he tells the ten lepers here. These ten lepers had probably heard of Jesus. They knew he was in the vicinity. They knew that he had healed lepers before. They were looking for him. They were waiting for him. And when they saw him, it says they met him. And they raised their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. The word master there is a very unique word. They they don't call him curious Lord. They don't call him teacher, rabbi, or anything like that. They use a different word. They say master. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. A master was more like a, a, a boss of a company. And Luke is the only one that uses the word here. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Very interesting here. We, we sometimes say in the church, when you come to Christ, you should never leave the same way you arrived, right? You've heard that. And that's power. That'll preach, Edwin. You never leave when you come to the presence of Christ. He changes you. Well, there's some truth to that in many levels. But they leave Christ in the same condition as when they met him. Okay? With the previous cleansing, Jesus heals the man with leprosy in Luke chapter 5, and then says, go show yourselves to the priests and offer the, uh, the sacrifices that Moses commanded. But this time it's different. Jesus is illustrating a different principle. He is using a different method. He says, I want you to leave me, do as I command you, and then you will find the blessing on the journey that I have in store for you. So they walk away from Christ by faith, believing and obedient to his word. They leave him still filled with leprosy, but they're, they're obeying, okay? And as they walk in obedience to the word of Christ, the Bible simply says they were cleansed. And I, you always wonder, what did it feel like? You know, how did it happen, right? But regardless of that, as they're walking away, as they're doing what Jesus has commanded them, the Lord honors their faith, honors their obedience, and all ten of them are cleansed. Now, verse 15, they all, as they saw, they all turn back and worship the Lord. Is that what it says? No, it doesn't. Very interesting. Now, one of them won a tithe, 10%. One of them when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. Now, there's there's all kinds of dynamics going on here, and and you wonder, well, did the other nine, they saw that they were cleansed, but they still wanted to obey, and they still went to the priests and did as, as Moses had commanded them, but something welled up in the heart of this one individual. And he said, what God has done for me is so significant. Before I can complete the task that God has given me to do, I must stop. I still have a task that he's given me, but he's done this great thing in my life. I have to stop and give glory to the Lord before I can take a step further. And Jesus acknowledges that. Verse 16, he fell on his face. So he's, he's obe- oh, all ten are going in, in obedience to the, to the Lord All ten are cleansed, but one of them says, I've got to at least pause in this. I've got to come and acknowledge and praise the Lord and acknowledge what God has done in my life through Jesus Christ. And he fell on his feet, uh, fell on his, uh, on his face at his feet, giving thanks, giving thanks to him. And then Luke adds, and he was a Samaritan. Okay. Okay. Again, a different, uh, uh, you know, a racial group than the Jews, uh, a group that the two did not often get along. They weren't often associating. But as lepers, apparently the other nine were Jews. Okay, they would have understood a little bit more about the Jewish custom of ritual cleansing and, and making the offerings and things like that. But this Samaritan, this foreigner, returns and gives thanks for the blessings that God has done in his life. Then Jesus answered and said, we're not ten cleansed. You always have to 
Let's pause. Whenever the Lord asks a question, it's not because he doesn't know the answer, right? He's making emphasis. He's making a point. We're not all ten cleansed. He, he knew all ten were cleansed because he was the source of cleansing through which, uh, you know, they were to receive that. Of course he knew that all ten were cleansed, but he asks it for emphasis. We're not all ten cleansed, but the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? Just a few weeks from the cross, right, is when this story takes place. Only this foreigner was willing to understand that God had done something in, 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 in their life and was willing to lift up their voice in thanksgiving and praise. Now, notice what he says in verse 19. He said to him, stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. And Luke you, loves to use this word sozo. It means uh, complete wholeness, not just physical healing, but emotional, spiritual, complete healing. Your faith has made you well. The other nine may have been cleansed, but it's not clear if the other nine had been made well. But because this one individual responded to the works of God in his life and lifted up his voice and, and oriented his whole body towards thankfulness, the Lord honored his faith, and he says that is the wholeness of healing and salvation and cleansing that you needed. Now, we often separate verses 20 and 21 from this story. I don't know how your Bibles line it up. I don't know if they create a different paragraph or they give it a new subheading or something like that. But it's interesting as Luke describes this, that he pairs up verses 20 and 21 with this story of the ten lepers. Now, having been questioned, this is verse 20, now having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed possibly referring to the sign of the cleansing of the leopards. Uh, lepers, not leopards. <laughs> cleansing of the leopards. Verse 21, Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. And then he says this, For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. The kingdom of God is among you. There's different ways it can be translated. The kingdom of God is even within you. And one way of looking at this is Jesus is referring to this story of the cleansing of the ten and the returning and thankfulness of the one and saying, as you see the works of God happening in people's life and people responding with gratitude and thankfulness, that's the kingdom of God. That's what the whole story is about. It's about people showing that they understand that God is in their life doing great and powerful things despite the circumstances. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. When you are thankful, you are enacting and illustrating and witnessing that the kingdom of God is in our midst. Which is scary to think of what it is when we're not doing that. Those who forget to thank God for blessings received and truly appreciate what God does for them are in grave danger of forgetting Him altogether. I saw that in the commentary and it, it hit me. If you forget to thank God for the blessings received and truly appreciate what God does for you, you're in grave danger of forgetting the Lord altogether. From whence do our blessings come? Well, I deserve them. I earn them. Why do I have to pray for this food? I went and I bought it. I earned the money to get it myself. I put it on the table. I cooked it. I set it before me. What does God have to do with that? I did it. I'm not going to thank him for that. I did it. I went and bought that truck. I went and did these things. What is that? You're taking God off the throne of your heart. You're putting yourself there and saying, I don't need God in any of this. I don't need his strength. I don't need his wisdom. I don't need his mercy. I don't need his forgiveness. I can handle life just fine all on my own. It is not him that helps me to have an ability, a job. Do you know that your every breath is a gift from God? Every time you breathe, every heartbeat, comes from the author of life. We are in danger of forgetting him 
all together. When we're unthankful, we testify to the weakness and irrelevance of God. But when we are thankful, we testify to the greatness and power of God. Oh, it's easy sitting in church. It's easy in the safe confines of the fellowship that we're here to say, oh, that sounds good. That makes sense. But you and I both know this is hard. This is hard. The first positive step towards the promised land of embracing an attitude of gratitude and thankfulness, it's not easy. And it takes divine intervention and power. Are you choosing to be thankful today? It is a choice. No one forces you to be cranky. No one forces you to complain. And I said last week, I'm preaching to myself here. This comes so natural to me. I am a cynical person by nature. I am, it is just so easy to slip into that tendency to complain. It takes the Lord's intervention. It takes power. Are you choosing to be thankful rather than critical? Are you asking the Lord to help you with that? Do you count your blessings on a daily basis? You know, psychologists will tell you to actually do that. It's not just a metaphor, but count them on your fingers. How many things? Just like the kids did for children's story, right? They were just voicing on, thankful for my pet and my parents and family and food and all these things. What were they doing? They were counting their blessings. Any of you ever struggled with depression? I mean, seriously struggled with depression? A few of you, yeah. Probably more common than we, than we recognize. Uh, I have friends that have seriously struggled with depression. One of the first things uh, they were told when they would meet with the psychologist is you are to physically list the blessings in your life. And it wasn't even like a Christian pastor or anything. This, this is just science. Acknowledge that everything is not as bad as you think it is. Do you smile? I'm just going to stop there. Do you smile? I have, a, I have a challenge for you. Next time you're in the store and you're around people, go and find the most unpleasant person you think you can see. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not joking. This is not tongue-in-cheek. I'm, I've done this before. Kind of even a little bit of a game at times. Find the most cranky, unpleasant looking person you can find. Go up to them and just smile. Just smile. And see what happens. See what happens. I want to hear your stories. I want to hear next week. When you come to church, I want to hear from you. Pastor, I did it, and this is what happened, and this is the bruise I got. No. Um, I'm telling you, folks, just a smile can completely change the environment around you. Do you smile? Do you pray and serve with an attitude of gratitude? Are you asking Jesus to help you overcome negative thinking in this life. The Christian journey without thankfulness is not very pleasant. We should be filled with the joy of the Lord. Amen? We should learn to not crave evil things. I'm going to close with that same passage that I thought was so profound at the beginning. Nothing, friends. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing, nothing tends to more promote health of body and of soul than a spirit of gratitude and praise. If we are heaven bound, how can we go as a band of mourners groaning and complaining all the way to our Father's house? Where are we going? We're going to our Father's house, amen? We are going to His place. 
We are going, you ever take your kids to grandma and grandpa's, right? Do they like going to grandma and grandpa's? Don't they sing along the way? We even have little songs that they sing about going to grandma and grandpa's house. We are on our way to the father's house. We should not be groaning and complaining. We should be filled with the joy of the Lord, with a spirit of thankfulness as we rely upon his Holy Spirit to be overcomers of the spirit of complaining. Let's pray. God in heaven, Lord, I know it's so easy to stand on a stage and pontificate about this and state what probably is the obvious to to so many of us, Lord. I know that deep down this is one of the primal battles that will determine our entire orientation in this life and in the life to come. One of the first struggles we have, even though we have been cleansed, even though we have been saved, even though we are on the path to the promised land, or we are on the path of obedience, as were the ten lepers, to recognize that you are with us and that you are healing us and you are making us whole on the journey and lifting up our voices and recognizing that you are the God who heals and saves. Lord, circumstances can be so tough. There are real struggles. There are real challenges that try our faith. But Lord, send us the Holy Spirit that we could see through your eyes, that we could put aside that damaging and deadly spirit of complaining. And we could rather be filled with your Holy Spirit and be filled with praise and gratitude and thanksgiving. May your people be thankful. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you. Looking forward to potluck. And if you're going to stay for our afternoon activities, we'll see you then as well. Happy Sabbath.